Welcome back, everybody. It's been a year since I think most of us have been in here, so we'll celebrate that later on. But here we are for our third meeting of the Kentucky United We Learn Council. So today I'm going to go over our agenda. I'm going to go over some logistical things, some housekeeping. If you don't remember what I say, feel free to come up with, to me at some point, and I will try to point you in the right direction. So do we have an agenda slide, Susan? Cool. Makes it a lot easier. Oh yes, here's the Wi-Fi. Um, join the KDE network and then there's gonna be prompts. So you need to put in your name and your email. If you have issues with that, flag one of us down and we can try to help you with it. But it should be pretty simple. Once you get on, you should be connected. So, all right. Okay, well, in your binders, we have lots of papers that we handed you today, unless you got a new one, then they're already in there. So we have all of these that we gave you today. I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory, but you've got your agenda first. Front is the first day, back is the second day. But, you know, we like to be flexible, so things could very well change. If we decide to go off on a whole separate way, we can. That's the nature of the work. So the next thing in there is a slideshow going to be these little four boxes about the recommitment and feedback survey. So this is what you all had to say about our first year. Go through that. Think about what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, what you want to change, things that just really resonate with you. See what other people put on here. See if you're kind of on the same track or if not. So that should be in there. And then we also for a one year reflection, we have our Humro grant. So Humro evaluators for the grant. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, we do have an evaluator. They're here regularly. They pop up in our meetings sometimes. They're there. They're keeping track of us and making sure that everything's going smoothly. So they have a little slideshow in here that you can review, but there's also the full report, and it is on the QR code that's in there. So it should be on the first slide, little black box that says full report here. So you can access that there. Now it's time for the agenda. So today we have a pretty packed day, but it's going to go smoothly. Um, first, we're going to hear from our chair and vice chair of the Board of Education and then also our new interim commissioner. And then we're going to have committee share outs. So everybody is going to hear from all the committees about what we're doing. You're going to hear from representatives from those committees. And that way we're all just really on the same page for what's happening as we go into this convening. And we have a break because I know that's something that was requested, lots and lots of breaks. So I think we built in more to this schedule than we have to past ones. Um, we're going to finalize our moonshot. So this is a really important thing that we're doing today that will guide our work for the rest of for the rest of our work um but we've been talking about the moonshot for the last year and today we're really going to nail that down and make sure that we're all on the same page so that we can do the best work going forward so karen and donnie are going to lead us through that process later on but there is there are some papers in your binder about the moonshot that we'll be using later on i think they're just their stakeholder input on the moonshot so be sure to review those when you have time so that we're the most informed that we can be and that we're representing the most people possible and then we have lunch my personal favorite and it's 45 minutes which is really good for public education because we usually don't get 45 minutes for lunch so next slide cool You all have the agenda. I can just keep going off of here. Then we're going to have standing committee time. Um, this is going to be our time that we're going to go back, work with those people that we've gotten really familiar with. Um, I think we're going to wait. I skipped one. Journey mapping and then standing committee time. So journey mapping is going to be an activity that we all participate in see all of our work around the room. Um, it'll be a fun activity. It's going to be one where we're reflecting, where we're thinking about what we want to do, thinking about things that we like, things that we don't, you know, just getting all that feedback and making sure that we are working the best we can. And then we'll have committee time. Um, for that, we are going to move around a little bit, I think, which one stays in here, Susan? VLE stays in here. DNF is in the commissioner's conference so bold new futures is in the commissioner's conference room on the fifth floor we'll have people to take you up there and then accelerating innovation is in conference room 516 and vibrant learning experiences is right in here 
All right. So after that, we're going to come back together and we're going to have our end of day reflections, which we'll talk about the moonshot. We'll talk about journey mapping. We'll talk about what we did in committees, all of those things, all wrapping it up together. And then we should be out of here by four o'clock. So that's our agenda for the day. I do have a few more little housekeeping things for us. Um, coffee. There's coffee in the back. In the black decanters, there is regular coffee, um, caffeinated regular coffee. And then in the pots with the orange handles, they have decaf. The ones that are in the machine are the refills. So try to use the black decanters first, and we will be refilling those throughout the day. Um, snacks. We have snacks this convening provided by Andre and the Center for Assessment. They're in the back. They're very pretty. Um, they look delicious, so throughout the day, feel free to get snacks, because um, it's going to be, <laughs> there's what? Tea as well. Oh, yes, there's tea as well. And we have, like, sparkling waters and all kinds of fun stuff back there. And then the bathrooms. The bathrooms are, if you go straight out and turn to the right, they're out that way, towards the cafeteria. So you'll be able to tell where they are, and then you just come back through, push the green button, and you get in. So you should be all good. I think that was all I had to cover. Nope. Oh, yes, new members. So we do have several new members here with us today. So when I call your name, just give us a wave, stand up so that we know who you are, and I'll tell you what committee you're on, so that way everybody who's on your committee knows as well. So we have Roland O'Daniel, Bold New Futures. There he is, yeah. We also have Sherry Anderson with Bold New Future. Yeah. And Tracy Leonard with Bold New Future. All right, and then for Accelerating Innovation, we have Delaney Stevens. Yay. <laughs> for Vibrant Learning Experiences, we have Kim Parker-Brown. Back there, all right. And then for VLE, we also have Lucian Yates. Not here, but you know, he's joining us in the work. And I think that's it. So I'm gonna transition to Vice Chair Young. Thanks, Audrey. Good morning. Welcome to the cool kids table at Cool Council. We are so glad you're back. Uh, thank you so much for the gift of your time and talent as you continue to work um, on this critically important initiative and effort of the Kentucky Board of Education. For those of you who've been hanging out with us since the fall of 2022, you heard about my obsession with President Kennedy's moonshot. Well, I am still obsessed today, and thanks to Audrey for um, teeing me up in that regard. Um, I expect one day that they, this team will want to send me to space camp if I keep doing this. So, and I want to add that my partner in crime on this, Donnie Tran, does have a space suit. So, uh, and Meredith Brewer has a space suit. So, I'm, I'm amongst ast astrological nerd friends in this effort. Um, but to stretch this metaphor today, I really want to stop and take stock of where we are as a cool council, um, more than a year in really, and uh, celebrate some of the um, wins that we have had along the way. As you know, in 1961, President John F. Kennedy challenged the U.S. to be the first nation to land a man on the moon and to return him safely, and to do so before the end of the decade. President Kennedy's efforts resulted in the greatest mobilization of resources and manpower in our nation's history. Thanks to his big vision and unwavering confidence in the ingenuity of the American people, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, stunning the whole world. But reaching the moon was a journey of many years. It didn't happen overnight. And sadly, President Kennedy died before it actually happened. Nonetheless, the team he inspired, resourced, and empowered to shoot for the moon remained staunchly committed to the dream, and they never lost hope for, that it would happen. In some ways, that's where we are in Kentucky this fall after the departure of Commissioner Glass. Now, he didn't pass away. He did depart Kentucky, but even though he won't be our commissioner when we land our moonshot, as we achieve our goal of transformed educational experiences for every Kentucky learner, the Kentucky Board of Education, under the chairmanship of Dr. Sharon Porter Robinson, 
Interim Commissioner Robin Kenney, and the entire Kentucky Department of Education team remain focused on the mission at hand, Kentucky United We Learn. So where are we and where do we go from here? The first thing the NASA moonshot folks had to do, as you might imagine, was to figure out how to get to the moon. They really spent a lot of time on the how. After rejecting a couple of early contenders, the team landed on the design of the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, LOR, which would take three astronauts to the moon, but transfer two into a lander that would descend to the moon's surface. One crewmate would remain in the command service module outside the moon. So you all may remember seeing some of those images. I liken this HAL phase of the NASA moon landing project to our local laboratories of learning phase in COOL. See how that metaphor stretches? So cool, right? Hang in there with me, friends. Um, thanks to many of you right here in this room, I see so many uh, L3 folks represented. The early design of our ultimate moonshot involves lots of prototyping to determine how vibrant learning, innovation, and deep community engagement look and feel in real schools and districts across the Commonwealth. Without the early designs that the L3 districts are pro providing us, and as the early uh, engineers did for NASA, we would never have ended up on the moon. The lore would never have morphed into ultimately the Apollo uh, satellite, or excuse me, ap Apollo um, thing. I've got it in here. See what a space nerd I am? Um, without those early designs, none of us, nor none of the NASA engineers, would have ever been able to, to reach their ultimate success in their mission. So thinking back over that series of missions, once they settled on the lore design, the team had to set their minds on building the new spacecraft. That's the word I was looking for, spacecraft. Apollo 11 was comprised of three parts, the command module, the service module, and the lunar module. Okay, this may be a bit of a stretch, but the bold new vision of United We Learn is also comprised of three big parts. Vibrant learning, experiences, come on, experiences for, it's working, right? For every learner, I put Donnie right here on purpose, and encouraging innovation in schools, especially as it relates to assessment and accountability, plus that third leg of our stool, deep engagement with communities. I'm proposing today that our three-part educational spaceship for Kentucky's future is an essential design and that we will lead ultimately to our success by leaning on all three of those important parts. Back to NASA, other key milestone efforts took place, as you might imagine, to inform the mission all along the way. Again, they just didn't get to the moon overnight. These implementation phases resulted in a series of ongoing wins and accomplishments that in and of themselves were singularly significant and important. The X-15 program launched the first human rocket-powered aircraft to cross the Karman line, which had been conventionally accepted as the boundary between Earth's atmosphere and outer space. So that was X-15. As a result, pilot Joseph A. Walker became the first human to enter the mesosphere. One of our cool moonshot early wins is the adoption by the State Board of Education of Kentucky's Portrait of a Learner. In October of 2022, the State Board approved a model Portrait of a Learner designed to promote a balanced approach to the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that we expect of every Kentucky learner. In response to the needs and aspirations of business and industry partners, business and industry partners, the Kentucky Portrait of a Learner was developed over a number of years with ample input from participating school districts, community shareholders, the department, and ultimately under the leadership of the Kentucky Board of Education and the Teaching and Learning Committee. I'm pleased to report today that it is having the desired effect by catalyzing local portraits of a learner and the development of those portraits across the Commonwealth. 
As of just last week or so, um, we have more than 90 school districts in Kentucky who have adopted a local portrait of a learner are, and are in some phase of development and implementation of that learner. Yay, big win. Um, with their own family and community partners as they go about implementing the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that they expect of every learner in their own communities. Other space victories during the Mercury phase, astronaut Alan Shepard was the first American in space on Freedom 7, and John Glenn was the first American to orbit the Earth on Friendship 7. Gemini 12 followed the Mercury series and established the final bridge to the Apollo programs. So again, this may sound like a lot, but this happened within a decade of the casting of the vision to land, to be the first nation in the world to land a man on the moon. One such intermediary but important step for COOL has been the regional efforts of our eight educational cooperatives in Kentucky to identify and empower deeper learning teams and leads in almost every school district across Kentucky. My UK team and I have had the privilege of working alongside our co-op partners to help strengthen these regional teams and their work to date has been really powerful at the local level. Frankly, I believe these co-op nurtured teams hold the key to sustainability. So really let that sink in a minute. What can our co-ops do by means of regional stewardship in support of the Moonshop of Kentucky United We Learn to ensure that their colleagues and neighbors right next door have the knowledge, skills, and expertise they need to move the implementation forward. I'm excited to watch the Co-op Deep Learning Network continue to take deep root across the state. And lastly, the Kentucky Deeper Learning Ecosystem continues to grow in small but mighty ways through the many teachers who have engaged in PBL Works training, the launch of the Kentucky Innovative Teacher Fellowship, now in its second cohort, and the math badging and micro-credentialing project, to name just a few. I'm a big fan of um, Adrian Marie Brown, who often says, small is all, small is good. And so these small but mighty efforts, uh, under the leadership of the team from the Kentucky Innovation uh, Office, these efforts um, are promising big gains in small ways for kids and teachers. Remember, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, right? So as I close, while these other accomplishments may not have been as memorable or sizable or lauded as actually landing and walking on the moon, they were completely essential to the ultimate success of the mission and should never be overlooked or forgotten. So you may feel like we're kind of in the middle of a lot of stuff right now, and the sexy promise of walking or landing on the moon isn't within reach. But I'm here today to encourage your efforts to um, lift up the ultimate vision of the moonshot. And I know that throughout this day today, you guys are going to be finalizing the language and the concepts and ideas that will take our moonshot vision to the next level of reality. As we pause this November to consider where we are with our cool moonshot mission, we must not underestimate all of the energy, thoughtfulness, trial, and error that the United We Learn team, you guys, have brought to reality over the past couple of years. We wanna celebrate those accomplishments, learn from our successes and our failures, and remind ourselves that we are well on our way to the moon. In keeping with the lofty go goals of President Kennedy's moonshot and those of every space mission since, our Kentucky United We Learn vision aims high, focusing on improving the student experience, the teacher experience, and the community experience in bold new ways. We have set our sights on meeting the full spectrum of needs of every Kentucky learner and every educator in every school in the Commonwealth, raising achievement for all learners and closing gaps among student groups 
while intentionally engaging communities in fulfilling the unlimited problem, promise of public schools in their own backyards. As we have achieved significant victories along the way, I am confident that you are the right people in the right place at the right time to ensure we reach and exceed our moonshot goals. In the immortal words of President Kennedy, man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in or not. And it is one of, great, of the great adventures of all times. I sincerely hope that every one of you will join us on our, continue to join us on our great adventure. And thank you again for being here today as we take one more giant step toward a bold new future for Kentucky's public schools and communities. And at this time, I'm delighted to turn it over to my friend and colleague. Thank you. Thank you to my friend and colleague, uh, Chair of the Kentucky Board of Education, Dr. Sharon Porter Robinson. Oh, wow. Good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I really want to reinforce what Lou has said to open us up this morning and reconnect us to the bold new future that we dare, that we dare to envision and embrace. We also are here today to assure you that during this time of transition, during this time that may seem a little chaotic, we're not coming here to encourage you in chaos. We're coming here to encourage you in reinforcing your commitment to the bold new future that we dare to embrace. We have started to um, make a reality the vision of a moonshot. And under Lou's leadership as in the chair of the board, we have developed our understanding of what that means in practical, real terms relative to policy and relative to the work that is done at the Kentucky Department of Education. Because I guess we all can admit, sometimes we've seen bureaucracies kind of get in the way of where they say they want to go because they are governed by habits and sometimes rules that are actually counter to getting to where we want to go in the most expeditious, professional manner that you know best of all. Those of you who are closest to the reality of the practice that we want to support. How do we address all of this that can be chaotic, that has been chaotic, that has been so consuming of so much time, effort, and energy that we ought to be putting into what will really get us there? I mean, I'm not trying to foment revolution, okay? <laughs> but I really am. <laughs> because we respect, we respect that if it's going to get done at all, the voice of demand has to be informed and cultivated at the level of folks who know best, who see it first, who know if it's working or not, and that's you. That is our community leaders, that is our practitioners, that is our district leaders, the folks who are closest to the kids, the learners that we want to serve. It's just axiomatic. Listen to the people who have the most interest, the most knowledge, the most passion to getting it done. So I commend us for embracing that as one of the pre three principal components of the action that we are about. The other thing that we say we want is to see practice actually mirror what we know about learning. 
I have often wondered how many novice practitioners meet the reality of their first assignment and wonder, well, how do I get done what I know needs to be done in the reality that I now face? I mean, sometimes that question never gets fully resolved because we are always compromising. We're compromising in deference to the adopted reading series or the approved math curriculum that does not include what you know your kids need. We are always compromising. How about we say, we're not gonna compromise on practice. We are going to do the work of making the reality of vibrant learning experiences for every student, happen for them every day, and happen for you as a method of fulfilling your passion for high quality professional practice. How about that? And that <clears throat> the third aspect of this is really important because, you know, you set out to get something done. You really want to know, are we getting in that direction? Are we moving in the, are, is it happening? Is it real for our kids? Is it real for our communities? And that's what accountability is all about. We embrace accountability as a principle, as a value that informs practice, that reinforces our passion, and that in, in, it actually infuels an informed policy. That's what accountability is all about. There's nothing threatening about it as long as we're measuring the right things. As long as we're using the right tools to collect data on what we really want to know, as long as we are courageous and act with integrity, say what the data says, speak the truth that it provides us, and address our reality with courage and determination. So your state board has figured out all right, how do we how do we guide ourselves? How do we govern ourselves in this period of transition that can present more confusion, that can cause us to waste a lot of time, effort, and energy, and really frustrate and compromise our passion for getting to where we want to go, which is supporting all the aspects of the Kentucky United We Learn, every single aspect of it. So we set out to articulate in clear terms the path that we're on and where we think we can go <clears throat> in the intermediate term. This term that we're in now, how do we stay disciplined? How do we stay focused? How do we stay accountable to where we say we want to go? So I present this slide, which is the concluding page of our plan of action, because I want you to just recognize that we get right back to the goal of assessment, innovative assessment, and accountability. Now, you know, you might say, well, <laughs> it's really a bit of irony that you should bring this up <laughs> the day, two days after the report card was released. <laughs> but that's a picture of where we are now and the things that we know how to count now. And I want you to understand there's a whole lot in that report card we should be paying attention to well beyond what the headlines in your local newspaper are likely to reflect. The issue of student attendance is not a matter of keeping a record for school funding. It is a matter of keeping track of a factor that bears on learning. It's serious. 
the issue of the increase of guns in school. That's a serious matter. We can't fix it in our place of power, but we need to bring that reality to the attention of those who may be able to join us in an effort to fix it. There's a whole lot of data in that report card that helps us understand if we're creating conditions in which students can experience vibrant learning. And the people who care a lot about that are those folks in your local community who need to be, who need to know. And we need to keep on keeping good, solid data on those factors that influence learning. And then we need to be accountable forever and ever to a vision of solid teaching practice that is reflected in the outcomes of what we measure. Now, we've got Portrait of a Learner out there, and it is growing and growing in interest and intrigue. Even students understand what this means. <laughs> they speak about it. They know the difference between being an engaged citizen and passing a test on a civics exam. They know the difference between being a contributor, a creative contributor in problem solving to answering questions on a test. They know that there is a difference in the skill and they know through vibrant learning that skill depends on content, using the content to get done what you need to get done and that's what the portrait of a learner asks us to measure and reflect. Now, we got a lot of barriers to get to the point where those measures are more important, I'm sorry, than test scores. And I used to work for testing companies, okay? <laughs> um, they don't get everything. <laughs> they don't get but a small fraction of what we need to know. <laughs> now we've got to get those other measures in sync with the content measures so that our students understand that what they can do with what they know is really, really valued. Teachers understand that the outcome we seek is enabling students to use knowledge to be an engaged citizen, <laughs> to be a co creative contributor, to be those things that they want to be that we've articulated in the portrait of a learner. So I want to assure you that we're hearing you. We know the risk that you're taking in some instances to engage in any aspect of United We Learn. And this board is really dedicated to supporting your continued work because we do understand sustainability in this work does not happen unless we create and support your voice of demand that it happen using the resources of this really amazing organization, the Kentucky Department of Education, to help support and make it happen. So you got us. You set this vision for us. You've got us as a, uh, with a vision that actually will guide the selection of the next commissioner. So to the extent that we're out there in space together, please be assured we are with you. To the extent that we are going to take some risk, please understand we see it. We're learning from it. We appreciate the courage and we're not going to abandon this action plan. Please be assured that we selected an interim commissioner who has committed to continuing this moonshot effort 
And with that, I'm going to ask Interim Commissioner Robin Kenneth Kenny to come and take the mic. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm LBJ. Okay, I'm LBJ. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, how fortunate are we as a Commonwealth to have such leaders? Um, Lou and Sharon. How fortunate are we? Um, both of them with the passion that they share with us today, but you know, they know firsthand. Um, they've been on the front line. And so they know the challenges that many of you deal with on a day to day ba basis in your classrooms, in your schools, in your districts. So we are just so fortunate to have you all. Um, and thank you very much. Um, some of you don't know me. Um, you're like, where where did she come from? Right? Uh, yeah, fourth floor. And I still get off on the fourth floor. <laughs> So um, my name is Robin Kenny, and I have the uh, pleasure of serving as the interim commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Education. I was appointed by the Kentucky Board um, effective September 30th, and so I've been on the job for one month. Um, so, but I'm not a stranger to education. Um, I have been uh, 13 years here at the Department of Education. Most recently, the last eight years, I have spent as the Associate Commissioner of the Office of Finance and Operations. So I am not an educator in the traditional sense that we think of an educator, but I'm an educator of how we do things within operations, finance, logistics. How do we help you get things done on the education side, the training, instruction, um, all the things that you all deal with, we try to remove those barriers and say yes to you so you can move things forward instead of getting stuck. So that has kind of been my training. I'm also an attorney. Um, I have not practiced um, I, uh, for many years. I started out in state government as a general counsel at economic development, where the very first thing you learn in economic development is the, the things that companies want is a very highly qualified, trained workforce. And where does that start? It starts in our classrooms. So that's the very first place that companies are looking. They want those people, and they want the people that come to work on time, that can look across the table and make eye-to-eye -eye contact with people, have a conversation, be collaborative. It's all the things that we are talking about right now in our portrait of a learner. So um, it is a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to soak it all up. I will also I also want to share with you just real briefly that um, my colleagues and I were over at the Interim Joint Committee on Education yesterday. And part of what we were there, we were there asked to present on, on the data release um, of a couple of days ago, and we've had a couple of references to that. But I want to compliment the committee itself on the agenda that they had yesterday. Um, it was very um, encouraging to see so many different walks of our communities that needed to be at the table together to talk about the future of our children. So for those of the, you that didn't get to tune in, um, we they had representatives there from the Administrative Office of the Courts and the County Attorney's Office talking about truancy and the impact of truancy on our ability to educate children. So that was a really eye-opening conversation, um, really intriguing to listen to their perspective on it. We also had the pleasure of having three of our local school districts presenting um, on innovation and what innovation can look like. So our special thanks to those superintendents from Rock Castle, Johnson, and Fleming County some of those L3 people, right? Yay! Um, and they talked about the innovation and really emphasizing local community input. So these words sound familiar? <laughs> Things that you all are working on really hard. So we're starting, we are seeing the fruits of your labor and their labor. And it's really important that we can communicate this to the General Assembly. We are so fortunate to have Representative James Tipton here with us. 
and his interest, his interest in what's going on in education. Representative Tipton is always very willing to listen and learn, and he's uh, obviously a strong supporter of education for us. So we thank him for being here today. Um, and then, of course, we talked about test data. So that's the other thing that we talked about yesterday. And the impact on test data for all these external factors that are causing challenges for us. So absenteeism. Absenteeism, the latest numbers, 29.8%. I mean, that's for chronic absenteeism. That means kids that are missing more than about 17 days of school a year. How can we provide high quality instruction if they're not even in the door or they're not remotely logged in? I mean, so we've got to tackle this absenteeism and it can't just be us, right? It's got to be we. It's got to be all of us. It's got to be the communities. It's got to be parents, guardians, um, everyone that touches a child has to help us with this issue. It's a big issue right now. Um, of course, the pandemic and floods and tornadoes have impacted our children and our staff. I mean, you know, they're still reeling from a trauma from that. So we've got to have those supports around them to make it so that they can come into the classroom and be their best. We also have issues that you all know about poverty and um, food insecurity. You know, there's a list of things that we have to make sure that we can um, get kids in a better place so that they can be ready to learn. But it was very encouraging to have all those people in front of um, the General Assembly yesterday all willing to talk with that common goal of how do we make it better? How do we improve? So the task that you are on right now, it's the right thing to do. It's a needed thing to do, but it's a necessary thing for us to do right now. We've got to change things to make it better. So I want to thank each of you for, for being here, dedicating your time. Um, and I will say very clearly, in my interim role, I'm very supportive of your work. Um, I encourage your work. And when we get to the next commissioner, um, once that happens, we will hand off your work and we will keep on going. So thank you again for coming. And I look forward to getting to know lots of people in the room. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to transition into our committee share outs. So I think Vibrant Learning is first. Vibrant Learning. Take it away. In our slides up, or is it just now? It should be. So, good morning. Greetings from VLE. We hope you're having a vibrant morning. Um, Standard greeting from Vibrant Learning. Um, uh, we are Vibrant Learning. We're here to give you a little bit of an update on all the hard work that our committee has been doing over the past really year. Uh, my name is Karen Perry. I work at the UK Center for Next Generation Leadership, and I'm the one of the facilitators of this standing committee. I'm joined by Sarah Snipes, who's too far away to just throw the microphone right now. We'll give it in a second. Uh, who works here at KD in the Office of uh, Innovation, um, and we're joined by our our vice chair, uh, Susan Sintra <clears throat> from Madison County. Our chair was unable to join today. Uh, he had a long drive from Western Kentucky and couldn't do it. So we miss him, but um, we're gonna represent him well this morning. So first of all, I guess I would say our mission, and we did choose to accept it, uh, is to transform the learning experience uh, for learners, to make vibrant learning the way that kids learn in Kentucky. Um, and we are aware that there are pockets of vibrant learning happening right now, but we really wanna make it the way kids learn every day, every kid, every day. So um, our first goal was really to define what vibrant learning means. And you actually received a survey 
uh, to this effect that is our proposed definition of vibrant learning um, and got a lot of good feedback on that. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But our first goal was really to establish a very clear sense of what do we mean by vibrant learning and to get on a page internally about what that means. We've really settled on, on a definition uh, that you did give some feedback on and we very much appreciate. But really the bottom line is it has to be learning that matters. It has to matter to kids. It has to matter to kids for them to come to school. It has to matter to kids to be something that they're interested in digging into and learning more about and tapping into their own strengths um, and passions. It has to be something that they're willing to commit to so they can transfer their learning from learning environment to learning environment and, and to environments beyond when they're even with us anymore and, and we're not telling them how to learn everything they need to learn. So vibrant learning has to be learning that matters. It's really the core of the definition. So that was our first six month goal. Our second goal uh, you see up here was really to begin to collect examples of vibrant learning and share it out with folks. Like I said, we are aware that there is vibrant learning already underway. There are pockets of vibrant learning happening now, right? But how do we find those things? How do we shine a bright light on them? How do we hold them up so that other people can see and learn from it? And how can we make more of it happen so that vibrant learning is the expectation for every kid every day? So in order to do that, we kind of adopted a, a little bit of a submission of shining through sharing. We wanted to take an asset-based approach to this. So we decided that we're going to collect evidence of vibrant learning. Uh, we're going to make a map of where vibrant learning is happening. Uh, and we're going to, in Kentucky, and we're going to um, establish some resources that will help people think about how do I begin, right? I'm a teacher. How do I begin to create these vibrant learning experiences? Or I'm a community member. How do I begin to partner with schools to engage in this conversation about creating vibrant learning? So uh, the first goal of learning that mat the, of the definition of uh, learning that matters, you received a survey uh, prior to this where you were asked to give feedback on this definition. And we really appreciate the good and thoughtful feedback that came back on that. I think the vote, there was a vote. Uh, the votes were 34 yeses and I think six abstains. Uh, and the abstains were uh, sent in the spirit of, we think this needs further definition, not no, but we think this needs further work. We agree that it needs further work. We also in the interim took this definition out to the L3 community of practice and got lots of good and thoughtful feedback. So one of the things we're gonna do over the course of the next two days is to continue to refine this definition. We'll bring it back to you for final approval from the full council, but your feedback has been really helpful to us uh, as we do that. So uh, this is our current working definition. It'll change over the next couple of days based on your feedback and the feedback from L3s and other folks, and we'll bring it back to you for next uh, approval. So I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Sarah now to talk about the rest of the vibrant learning goals and the work that we've had underway. Thank you, Karen. Um, and just to center also these presentations and those to come, really thinking about that moonshot uh, that Vice Chair Young mentioned and like how we see the work happening across these committees really shaping that, that unifying and shared direction that we're headed in. Um, I know that's been incredibly powerful within our own standing committee, um, and I'm just so eager to dive in over the next couple of hours into collecting and reflecting on this work that's happened within our team and others into shaping that common vision for our full group. Um, and so, you know, it took some work for us to get to the point of actualizing some of these plans and goals that we had for ourselves. Um, some key activities that have happened over the last year within our group have been establishing those work groups centered around um, the most recent six month goal that we had. So we had members of our group break out into work groups based on interests and expertise around defining VLE with those indicators and criteria. Um, those who were more interested in thinking about those simple shifts for educators and creating that map of VLE. We also conducted site visits, um, so we're able to uh, visit places like Marshall County uh, in doing um, presentations of learning around project-based learning. Uh, we also went to see uh, Eminence and thinking about the innovative work that happens uh, around their Eminence exemplars, a, a local version of their portrait of a learner as well. 
Uh, we've had presentations from experts both within Side Kentucky with our deeper learning teams and our statewide deeper learning director. Uh, we also welcomed uh, Transcend Education's Canopy Project, uh, which actually has been a, a huge inspiration for us in the work that we've done around this mapping of vibrant learning experiences. We have researched publications within our team as well, such as that KBE's call to action, as well as uh, the Council of Chief State School Officers um, Imagining More report, um, which hopefully you all have also been able to engage with a little bit. And we've done some deep dives into existing KDE databases like our best practices database. Um, and then we've been really excited lately to even collaborate more with other groups like our Accelerate Innovation team uh, in thinking about what does the systems bank start to look like um, and what, what is its relation to vibrant learning. And we've learned a lot along the way. Uh, we also kind of brought this to our L3 leaders um, as Karen and I share that space and thinking about, uh, you know, defining VLE as a balancing act uh, we need to be clear um, enough to differentiate between our traditional approaches, uh, but be inclusive as well. Um, again, as Karen mentioned, this is already happening in Kentucky. Um, so while we're also trying to build capacity and spread the work, we're also mining and going out to lift up and elevate uh, and shine that bright light on where it's happening. Uh, clear connections. We've wrestled with this a lot as a council and within our committee. There's this clear path and connection to Port Trivia Learner being a vehicle that drives vibrant learning experiences in those instructional shifts. And then thinking about measuring VLE against those traditional metrics, um, and then uh, also bringing in a new set of measures and collaborating with other uh, committees has been important to us as well. And so from those three working groups, we're really seeing that we're in this time of the work kind of converging uh, our efforts around this database where this mapping idea is originating as well around where vibrant learning is happening in Kentucky. And so we're starting to develop a prototype of that. And I'm, I'm excited to dig in a little bit more of the next two days to really uh, solidify this a little bit more. Uh, so thinking about annual submission windows where a school or district can submit examples of VLE, uh, giving it a summary of the experience, tagging core practices that are at work, um, and, and then submitting both teacher and student facing artifacts from that learning experience. Uh, so initially, just again in the prototyping phase, what does it look like for our Vibrant Learning Experiences Committee to vet and lead that work um, and publish that in a public facing way so that others can learn? We still have a lot of questions, as you can see, what are the roles of this council, other committees, the agency and the board? Um, and where do we publish this so that it's useful to communities? Um, the, our greatest fear is that it's a resource that sits in the deep, dark depths of the web and isn't utilized by the people who need it most. And so how do we make it matter? How do we give it currency, make it relevant, and put it somewhere where it's utilized? So just looking ahead, again, I think this is a deliverable that we can hopefully put in front of you soon thinking about a submission form by which schools and districts could um, provide us with their best examples of a vibrant learning experience, um, identifying indicators that apply to that experience, describing it, identifying those core practices and attaching any relevant pieces of evidence, both from the student and educator side. And just considering some early feedback pieces to that. Um, we've used a lot of resources that have inspired this. We're leaning heavily into our definition. Um, so again, appreciate the feedback because it shapes so much of our work as we continue. Um, and then when we asked L3 leaders and other committee members on their feedback, they're really interesting and interested in seeing something uh, that has robust searchability. So being able to break down grade levels, um, tags of core practices, Visuals are very important to folks as we've reached out. And then thinking about uh, they want to be able to identify schools and sites for visits and to learn more from these folks. And then vetting is important. So making sure that we can rely on the examples that are provided in this database uh, and, and providing that validity as well. And before we pass it over to Bold New Future, just quickly ask if anyone has any questions for Vibrant Learning. We nailed it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Penny. I got need. I don't need that. Um, it's required. <laughs> um, 
just under, being cognizant of who is in the room, we have some parents, we have some community members who may not understand some of this terminology. What is the canopy project? Mm -hmm. And can we look back at some, there's, there was another term, there was something else, uh, just to be sure that everyone understands what it is we're talking about and that they under, they really get where we're going. Yep. But can you first start with the canopy project? And I can't remember the other one. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. So the canopy project is uh, a, a research um, project through Transcend Education, a national nonprofit, um, who's really doing this effort at the national level. And so uh, it's a, an online national uh, public facing database where schools are nominated uh, from approved uh, nominators. So the Kentucky Department of Education actually is an approved nominator in this case. Uh, if there is a school that is nominated, uh, that they are innovating in some way in education, according to some criteria, uh, then a nominator can submit that form and that principal will receive notice that they've been nominated and can submit a further survey to upload similar evidence. Yes, we are innovating in this way. Here are some of, here are some of the practices that we use, project-based learning, trauma-informed practices, advising, mentoring, um, some core elements of ways that we innovate in our school. And they can also submit things like, how long have we been doing this? Some schools are just starting. Some have been on this journey for quite some time. Um, and so from there, if that principal chooses to respond to the nomination and submit more information to the Canopy Project, they will then have a page within a portal that folks can go visit. So it is that map element. You'd see a map of the United States. There's a dot actually right now in Logan County. Uh, of an elementary school there, you can click on them and you get this page that says what they do that transforms the learning experience, how long they've been innovating in this way, some of their core shifts and practices. Um, and so one dot isn't enough for us, right? We know that Logan County has amazing things happening. They're also an L3 district, uh, but we need more dots on that map. We want to light it up uh, in Kentucky. And so really we want to take that concept and zoom right in on Kentucky and create a database by which we can share and connect the powerful learning that happens. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. The definition, could you go back to the definition of a vibrant learner? And you said that you had some people that abstained. What type of comments? I know you said that they were pretty much along the same lines. Did they give any I, um, any comments in regards to what they think needs to be added or subtracted from the definition? And how soon do you think you'll have that definition uh, ready for us to review again? Thank you for the question. Um, lots of the feedback. Um, there were a few questions about the tagline learning that matters. There was a question about learning that matters to whom. Our intent is learning that matters to students. So we like we can we think we can fix that, right? To clarify at least what our intent is, which is this has to matter to kids to be vibrant. Otherwise, you know, it's not gonna be vibrant to them. Um, there were some um, some feedback around the little bit uh, of, to Penny's point of like the edge you speak that's in here, cognitively engaged was a word. Like, do we really, we educators know what that means, but is that widely, you know, understood to really mean what it is? Um, there was um, a question or two about, I guess I would ca characterize them as questions about foundational skills. So we're assuming that kids can read we're assuming that kids can produce personalized products that demonstrate their knowledge of mastery and skills, but the commitment in here to foundational skills was not expressly articulated. And so that was a, a several, a couple of the comments were along those lines. Um, uh, those were the big categories of it. Um, and then lots of questions around how do we do this, which gets to the next part of like after the definition becomes clear, how do we support people in this? I guess I would say the map is part of that. <clears throat> um, 
Uh, and, um, you know, but it's just the beginning to say, I, I, I need to go see it. Where can I see it is just part of it. There needs to be further discussion about, um, and the back there is reminding me, there was a comment from the L3s about, um, agents of their own learning, but really where are families and communities in this? So having, uh, all those stakeholders represented in the definition, right. Um, as not just. Go ahead. I think the suggestion was facilitated by families, schools, and communities so that we are not cutting out the importance of teachers and families and schools yeah. and, and communities. Absolutely. And that it really becomes, if you really want vibrant learning, if you think about what a vibrant learning experience is, it's authentic, which means it has to be connected to other people in lots of ways outside of a classroom, sometimes inside the classroom, but also outside the classroom. And that requires help from parents, community members, et cetera. So yes, I think that was another bit of feedback that we got. Um, so the second part of your question was, uh, when do we think we're gonna have this? We're gonna work hard to get this revised over the next two days in committee time, if possible, to bring it back. I think um, we said with Karen that we'll probably um, send out another email, another survey to folks uh, for, um, for final approval. So um, I, I hope that you've heard them, some things in here that inform your own thinking of the moonshot. Um, you know, this, these are steps along the way. This is not the moonshot. These are steps along the way and important things we have to have along the journey toward the moonshot. So we hope that you heard some things in here that at least inform your thinking about the long journey of the moonshot and we also we're going to turn it over to i think it's ai next a bold new futures next uh, we hope that you'll hear some some things that inform your thinking about the moonshot um from bold new futures as well but first i'm going to turn it over to donnie um hey everybody uh we're just going to give you a few minutes now to discuss at your tables what are the implications for the moonshot that you heard in this presentation and we'll do that in between each one Okay, so that because the purpose of the next agenda item is to finalize our moonshot. Um, so discuss that at your tables now. Good morning. I am Edna Shack. Hey, Mike. Um, I am a member of the Bold Nude Futures Committee. Um, I don't have an official role in education anymore. I retired from Moorhead State University several years ago. Um, I taught teachers for um, 34 years, and now I am a city council member in Moorhead, and I'm loving being able to connect and work towards connecting families and community, my community, and um, the work we're doing at the state level, education, as well as the work we're doing in Round County. So it's been fun to be a retired connector. <laughs> or a connector who's retired or something like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm reporting on Bold New Futures. Um, it's hard to believe we've been here a year, um, but we have. And this is our committee. Uh, neither chair or vice chair could be here today. They are very busy 20-somethings or 18-somethings, <laughs> which I understand, and that's great. They should be. Um, and this is the rest of our committee. Uh, I think a good number of you are here this morning. Thank you. Um, and we had in November our goal. So, so Bold New Futures, our, um, our overarching goal is to create a framework that can um, I, uh, reflect what the citizens said in our Kentucky United We Learn report. Um, and that as a policy framework. So we have, um, we did an opportunity analysis. That was our, our November goal. We set out to do an opportunity analysis. We had the help of KnowledgeWorks to dig into our, primarily our assessment and accountability um, policy to see where we might be um, not, where there might be policy barriers to what we wanna do with Kentucky United We Learn. Um, 
And so we got the opportunity analysis. We looked at that in April. We agreed, we kind of hashed over some of the pieces of it and then came up with um, our next six month goal was to collect data to better understand how the communities were looking at, different stakeholders were looking at the portrait of the learner. And so we, um, develop that's that was our goal where I'm going to get into that in a minute a little bit more um, so one of the re one of the things that happened was we kind of split into two groups a communications group and a policy group and that policy working group um, was decided to extend that to others who are not necessarily on our committee on the cool committee but who are um, really working in that policy world where they understand uh, what policy, what policy is there, they've really dug into it. And so that enabled that group to really dig into it. And then they brought to us a recommendation that we'll look at in a minute. Um, that group does have three representatives from our committee. And then also we brought in some KDE policy advisors from the uh, Continuous Improvement and Support, Office of Teaching and Learning and the Assessment Office of Assessment and Accountability. We also have a KEA, Eddie Campbell, and then a student voice person on that team. And then they bring back to the, the full committee their recommendations. And anybody else who's on this committee who wants to jump in where I might not be touching base correctly, let me just jump in. Um, so the, the policy worker had a recommendation. It came out to us. Um, in our um, in email where we voted on it. And this is the wording of the policy recommendation language. And I believe that um, Meredith is gonna make sure that you have access to these slides because there are a lot of words on it. Um, as a teacher, I don't generally use so many words on my slides, but there's a lot of information to get across here. <laughs> um, so you may just take a minute to read through that. Basically, it's allowing, extending the use of funds to be able to learn more about what L3 districts are doing um, so that new districts can jump in on that and learn uh, from each other. Um, we had a vote. Uh, we had 70, almost 78 percent said yes and some no and abstains. The abstains were mostly like, I'm not really sure about this because I don't know enough about it. The no um, was felt like there should be more about um, communities and families uh, in in brought into this because it goes back to the original Kentucky United We Learn re report where there was a lot about um, families and communities in that report. I learned a little bit this morning, and we're going to be digging more into that as we go forward. So um, just if you're in on the BNF group, just hold tight. We're going to move forward on that. Um, all right. Then we also um, got stakeholder feedback. This is our April goal to get stakeholder feedback on the um, using the portrait of a learner as a graduation requirement. Um, we we actually made a recommendation to the state board, and I think it's kind of put on hold until we have, is that correct? It's sort of on hold. Great, okay, thanks for that, Meredith, yep. Um, we, and this went out um, online and we got feedback from them. What was interesting is we had educators and non-educators, and you can see that the big themes that came across, there's um, some agreement there, uh, in particular preparation for the future. So we're not only, uh, we talk about developing um, a future in education, but we're really developing a future for our world. And and I think that comes comes out in, um, everyone's comments about preparation for the future and, and that deepening and developing skills and equity for all. Um, from the educators, these were some of the comments that supported their three primary themes, uh, student voice, 
better ways to assess student progress and success. Again, you know, that just re reconfirms what we learned from um, Dr. Glass's listening tour. People want a better way to think about how we work, uh, how we assess what students are doing. And I absolutely loved Sharon Robertson's comment this morning about truancy. That data point is not about truancy. It's about what those kids are missing. And that's so, you know, if we can dig deep and let people get that message, we, it's, it, get that message. Um, it's part of what we are, and that's also part of what our committee, we have a subcommittee on communication, and those are the key kind of points that we need to push out there and let people know that this is what we're about. We're trying to help everybody, even those kids who think they don't want to be there. And then comments from uh, the non-educators supporting their primary themes, and you'll see similar kinds of things. Focus on something beyond test scores. Um, ownership, let students get ownership of their learning. And I think that comes out in the uh, definition of vibrant learning, that the students have ownership of and, and understand that they're part of this. It's learning that matters to them. Maybe that word ownership will help you guys. <laughs> Sorry, that just occurred to me. Okay, so there are challenges. Uh, we all know there are challenges. And that's another thing that I liked about Sharon Robinson's talk is that it's messy. It's messy to change things. And it reminds me of when I taught um, and my students would go into the classroom and sometimes, you know, they, they'd have their lesson plan and it would they'd feel like it was a script and they had to follow it. And I said, it's okay if you don't follow, it's messy. And the messier your classroom is, probably as long as the kids are talking about what you're doing and what you want them to learn, and so that messiness is probably leading them to some kind of understanding. So that um, when I got let go of lesson plans and started thinking about messiness is when I really started loving teaching. <laughs> um, so there are, are concerns and the increased workload for educators la and lack of preparation. That's the one that I keep pushing on. It's actually why I'm here um, way back. I got involved in this because I said, um, are there any teacher preparation people in the room? <laughs> and so I, I will keep pushing on that because if we are not preparing our teachers for this kind of teaching, I think we are in pockets, but do we have the evidence that all teachers are being prepared to teach project-based learning, to teach that learning is not necessarily just following a script, uh, then we were, it'll be hard for us to get move forward. Well, we, what we will end up doing is continually doing professional development. If we get them early on, our professional development can get deeper. And so I'm hoping that that is something that we do. That, um, trans youth populations, that's a real, question. I'm on the L3 in Round County and, and the students who are not there, we're developing a, a process where they can record what they're doing from elementary on forward towards the what we call the Valiant Viking, Portrait of a Learner. But those kids who are, who are coming in and out, they may not have a continuous process. So how do we, how do we w work with those kids and help them? Um, key takeaways, and I noticed this on the others, we really need to be working with other our other committees, figure out how do we work with those other committees. Um, implementation, how is things implemented? I think I jumped ahead there a little bit, but. Um, and listening to communities and families when considering educational changes. That's, um, and I see Brooke Gill over there and, um, I don't know if all of you are aware, but Pritchard Committee received what, a state scaling grant. Is anybody from Berea, the uh, the other state scaling grant? There are three state scaling grants in the country. Two of them are in Kentucky for full service community schools. So that's really an opportunity for us. <laughs> for us to be connecting that piece of our of what's going on in our state to what we're doing and we kind of talked about a way that we might approach that where we can do some policy or work around that piece as well so that when the grants end kde has already got things on the books that 
will let us roll into that state scaling of full service community schools. Um, the policy group that really helped to kind of really dig in and get some recommendations made. So we're proud that we've gotten the opportunity analysis done. We, we have a recommendation around policy and we have also collected data from our stakeholders. Um, and here's the piece about working. How do we work with our other committees and make all this tie together? And then some of the challenges that we have ahead of us. So, oops, that's a 15 minute break. My, I had a summary slide, but I guess it disappeared. <laughs> just a summary of what we what I just talked about. But anybody have any comments or questions? Miss Penny. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Edna Shack. <laughs> um, I want to talk about Portrait of a Learner okay. and the recommendation you all had. You said you put this to you addressed this to the board, submitted to the board for it to become a graduation requirement. Yes, it's go. It's going for first reading. That's not it. OK, so this could very well lead into like 30 questions, so I'll back <laughs> up on this. Um, but two things quickly, and then we can address this later. The first thing is, does that mean that we're going to try, or the board is going to try and figure out a way to mandate that portrait of a learner be accepted by every district because there are some districts who do not have, nor do they choose to accept a portrait of a learner. And the second thing is, how do we handle the inequity in certain areas when it comes to portrait of a learner? And that's not about a portrait of a learner, that's about education in general, because I'm automatically going to our DJJ babies. How is that going to be addressed? How are we going to set those you parameters know. for kids with disabilities? <laughs> you, Meredith, you knew I was going to do this. No, <laughs> love you. No. Yeah, so, well, it was 30 seconds ago, I forgot. But essentially, the inequities that are already embedded and built in, do we address those first before we try and bring in portrait of learners? So the board is planning to entertain those amendments in December, but it'll be a first read. So the board discontinued the practice of having two reads for every regulatory amendment several years ago. However, they retain the option to do so if there is a potentially controversial change or something that requires additional dialogue. So they are planning to have that be a first read. One thing that I really want to emphasize uh, is that we have given a very long run runway as part of this proposal. So the way that it's currently drafted, it would not go into place until the entering freshman class of 2025. So they would not be doing these demonstrations of learning as part of graduation until 2029. So many, many years from now. Um, so that's important because that gives us time to think about that implementation step, right? So we know that that is the long-term goal. We've all agreed that we need to think about the student experience in a more complex way. And that's why so many of our districts have decided to develop a portrait um, because they know that there's more to the student experience than perhaps what we've been capturing. But we still need to be able to think about what it looks like to have this pretty significant shift take place across the whole state. The other thing that I will emphasize, the board did pass an amendment to graduation requirements around the early graduation program last year, and students who are in the early grad program are required to have a demonstration of learning. And it doesn't explicitly say portrait of a learner. It really speaks to competencies that have been identified. We have some in statute that have been in place since 1990 about competencies uh, that we want for every learner. So it's really alluding to this idea of the whole student. So yes, I think that's the hope. So what, what the board really wants to do is frame out this is where we're headed, everyone. So everyone's on the same page. And then we really, as a department, and as a council, will need to dig in and figure out how do we successfully get there? Because we know that's where we need to be headed. Does that, yes? Okay. And I think that ties into that, that's still on, that recommendation of providing, allowing funds to be used to 
listen to go find out what other districts are doing so that those districts who haven't started it yet have have a foundation to start from uh, just a comment uh, i think i was comforted to hear meredith mention that this was going to be a first read and then uh, is there been some thought or discussion of how long a period between the second read because uh, you know while i think we have gotten our minds around this in this group here because we've had time to talk and 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 learn more about it the the folks in the field uh, will need some significant time to grapple with what does this mean what does this look like those kinds of questions that Penny just asked and many more will arise and um, so you know my advice and wish is that uh, if we want this to really take root is we have to give the people in the field enough time uh, to understand it and ask their questions and uh, and hopefully rally around it um, as a as a path forward in kentucky but um, i'm just a little concerned about going too fast too soon and derailing it if we're not careful good point jim there's a quick that is there a timeline before the second reading? So typically it is the next meeting would be the second reading, but Which there's nothing be. that requires that. So we could postpone it. So we meet every other month. So February, and then we could, we meet again in April and so on and so forth. So we can sort of decide what makes the most sense based upon that stakeholder input that we would want to gather between the first read and the proposed second. Um, you know, we do have to consider the regulatory timeline. So we obviously want any graduation requirement change to take effect with an entering class. So anytime we miss that sort of effective date, um, we would want it to be kind of in the summer if possible. And it takes about seven to nine months for a regulation to work its way through. We would miss an incoming class. So we just want to make sure that we're thinking through that timeline so that, you know, we are fully committed to that for let's say entering class of 2025, to know that that's the expectation that they are entering into with their first day of school as a high schooler. And Jim, I think what you're saying also speaks to the BNF's reasons for doing two subcommittees, a policy and a communication. And I think the policy committee is probably doing a good job of communicating at this level. I think we need to work harder on that communication group and how do we get a common statement or communication to to everyone, to our families, to our communities? I mean, I I want to be able to bring this to my council, and and I've mentioned it to them. But I'd love to have something that I know everyone else is also bringing to their councils in their communities about what United, Kentucky United, yeah, cool is, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's something we might need to work on in our BNF committee is, is getting a really common statement, brief, straightforward. This is where, what this is, this is where it started. Here's where you can get information. Hi, my name is Rhea Eisenberg and I'm an elementary librarian. I'm on the Vibrant Learning Committee. And so I know that, um, our committee has worked on, um, getting examples of vibrant learning and that sort of thing. And so I hear the portrait of a learner will be something that um, we will look for with students as they graduate um, in 2029. So as an elementary person, how um, are we tasked uh, to help prepare students and what might, and I'm sure we don't know yet, what might that look like so that those teachers are able to help move those students forward? And I do want to say this is one step of many. So as um, Vice Chair Young spoke about with the moonshot, right, there's important milestones along the way. That is not the end goal, is not amending graduation requirements only. That's just a tip of the iceberg, really. And so the true aspiration would be that from day one, as part of a student's educational journey, we are working toward the development of those knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And that is why the board decided to name their portrait that they modeled the development of a portrait of a learner rather than a portrait of a graduate. So the expectation would be that that portrait becomes part of 
the ecosystem within your community, right? That everyone is aware that those are the things that your community values and that you want to be working toward at every grade level. So very much into the elementary. And we have board members who are former elementary school teachers that ask those very same questions about kind of what does this mean for me in my classroom at you know the earlier grades. And so I think the expectation would be that everyone is learning that process of sort of how do I demonstrate this learning? How do I embed through my deeper learning experiences that I am facilitating in my classroom the opportunity to show that I'm a creative contributor or whatever your local district has sort of named some of those skills that you've identified? Does that answer your question, sort of? Yes, okay. So we have one question here from Renee, and then we're gonna go to our like reflection time. And so if you have other questions, raise your hand during that time. And I know like we have one at Damien's table over there and we will send our BNF reps to discuss that with you. So Renee? I just wanted to echo what um, Meredith just said. And especially from an elementary perspective, we noticed when we saw the test scores, how the elementary schools have gone forward and, and increase their scores. I think when we look at portrait of a learner, we have to look at the creativity that's needed so that we continue to build those math, reading, and other test scores through project-based learning. And it's, it, it does require a lot of creativity, but it's gonna be fun. And I think in the long run, it can reduce truancy because we see as the aftermath of COVID, this increase in truancy. But when kids get involved and they're actively engaged in learning, I honestly believe the truancy will decrease. And I think it can also have implications with DJJ because as I listened to the reports with the Interim Joint Committee on Education, we saw that truancy in, in causes are, can lead to an increase in criminal activity of youth. Thanks for that, Renee. And I do think it's very important for all of us to be very thoughtful in how we speak about the portrait of a learner, that it is not in addition to foundational content knowledge. It is about exploration and mastery of content knowledge and these additional skills. It is really about that multifaceted approach to the reality of the student experience, right? It is about thinking more holistically about the hopes and aspirations that we have for our students as they progress through school. So it is not about the portrait lives over here and then reading, writing and arithmetic live over here. Those are very much entwined. So we want to be sure it's about vibrant learning, David Cook. Is this what you do for a living, David? I think maybe. Okay. So now it's time. We're going to take a few minutes. Talk amongst yourselves yeah. on this. We're going to take a few minutes to talk about in your groups what this would look like for the moonshot, any implications you have, and then raise your hand if your table had like another question for Meredith and Edna. Our accelerating innovation representatives. Is it Andre? I gotcha. All right, so accelerating innovation will be our last committee. Well, it is our third committee, so it's our last committee share out and then we will have reflection or questions, reflection, then a break, I think. I mean, I don't know who designed this. They put us right before the break. I will talk fast, y'all. Um, so I'm Sarah Hatton. I'm the director for secondary instruction for Adair County Schools. And um, I've got my lovely co-chair over here, Kathy Stovall. Kathy, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kathy. <laughs> I'm who I am. I'm Kathy Stovall and co-chair. And actually, this might be out of protocol, but actually for our committee, I would like to say to Sarah, thank you for an awesome job you've done and give her a round of applause. She has been a good, strong leader and very supportive and um, just, I'm just excited about the work that we've done and Sarah's going to kick us off. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate that. Okay, so we have come a long way this year. Um, we started off with our definition for our first six month goal was doing a lot of research. And so we looked at both local systems here in Kentucky, we looked at national systems, and then we even dabbled in some international waters to do information gathering about historical approaches to um, 
the frameworks around what works and what's not worked in assessment and accountability. And we've talked quite a bit um, over at my table over here just about the connections that we're seeing amongst all these committees going into the work that Vibrant Learning is doing and the proposed policy changes with Bold New Futures. But all that really hinges on transforming that assessment and accountability system. And then after we did so much research, looking at our L3s, looking at different state systems, and then even looking at um, some other countries, Finland, South Africa, um, I think Singapore were some of the ones that we looked at. We took all of that research, we wrote a giant report, um, presented that to KBE's board meeting back in March of this year, and then came back in April and transformed that work into our next goal, which is to start thinking about different models. What are some different models? Taking all of the historical and um, innovative research that we looked at, what are some different models that we can pull together, including our design principles, and start exploring those opportunities between the different trade-offs between having a lo completely local system, having a state um, system, and then having this federal system. So our work redesign, kind of, we, we summarized those findings. We split into some work stream groups when we were doing research, um, which we discovered had pros and cons. We felt like some, some of us were kind of isolated and not really knowing what was going on with the other groups. And so we've not done that um, since, but we, we presented that work to KBE back in March. We did some design principles for how we wanted a assessment and accountability to look, like what were the key points and the criteria that we were looking at and we were designing that work, created a committee charter in accordance with our grant deliverables, developed some different prototype models for assessment and accountability, including that locally controlled, really taking a lot of look at the work that the L3s are doing in Kentucky, some state supported and then state centralized work, and then talked about the essential design features and design ideas for those. And then we are still in the middle of working on some systems bank work. And that's really getting into cross committee work for that piece. Kathy, do you want to talk a little bit about, more about that there? And just looking at what we did in terms of creating just the conversations that we've had today, we've looked at at bullet number three, created design principles for accountability and assessment. And just talking with the table that I'm with, we noted the importance of communication be across committees and how what vibrant learners are looking at applies a lot to some of the design principles that we are thinking about as important when it comes to accountability and assessment. So matching those up is really one of those things that we were thinking. I, I started thinking about from just listening to it. So our accountability design system, we learned a lot of lessons and they were great lessons. They were lessons where um, we came together as teams to be able to establish what we were going to do. And so one of them was working collectively to bring uh, people together in challenging but rewarding ways. And so we were, and we didn't always agree and um, I think they probably will say I was the one that least agreed, <laughs> but we, I brought everybody around. We'll just say it like that. <laughs> yeah, I did. I always made them think I'd sit quietly and then I'd start off. But uh, diverse, uh, we're diverse in backgrounds and expertise, which was one of those things that was important to me. And that, I, because I know that leads to stronger outcomes when you have that diversity. And we did bring that diversity to our group and everybody felt comfortable in sharing what what they saw was important and what needed to be addressed in terms of the work that we were doing for assessment and accountability. Uh, the landscape of assessment and accountability, that was a learning curve for me. And I think for some of the other people that were part of our committee, that was really important for everyone to make sure we knew what we were looking at and what it meant for accountability and assessment. Uh, and then we looked at the uh, cross culture, uh, cross committee collaboration. And that's one of those things that we will definitely be continuing and looking forward to for the next year in terms of what it means, the work we do, how it integrates into the work that our committees are, do other committees are doing.
We also had an opportunity to participate in some of the activities that the other committees were involved in. Uh, Karen Perry, they invited me to go with them on one of their L3 visits. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get invited back again, because <laughs> again, I was challenging everything. I had lots and lots of questions. Uh, I grew up in a large family, and so I always got my questions in when I had questions, and I still do that. Uh, so Cross Culture uh, participated in an L3 group uh, when the L3s were meeting, and that was an opportunity to understand where they were coming from and what they were focused on and got a lot of good ideas that we can incorporate into accountability and assessment, uh, creating a review, uh, creating a process for reviewing each stage of the work and we kept it up to date. That was one of those things that was really important is making sure that we got the information out and to everyone so that they had an opportunity to review it. And again, out of protocol, but I thought we had the best team ever. That's just, you know, I come from a big family. We were a team, you know, when they saw the stovalls coming. It's a teeny bit competitive. <laughs> No, not I don't think of myself as competitive. She drives, she drives our work forward. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, we got to go. We got to move forward. We got work to do here. And uh, it takes time and effort to get everyone on the same page. But hearing everyone's voice strengthens our collaborations. So that was those were the things, the lessons that we learned that really made a difference for how our team worked together and the work that we're doing. Because like, like I said, some days we would go, what are we doing? And then other days we would go, we're ready to go. We know what we're doing. And so we move forward with that. And uh, some of the things that we grappled with, I'll do the strategic issues. We kind of broke them down. Andre helped us with that. Shout out to Andre and Susan. Love you guys. And where's Jennifer over there? They were awesome leadership that kept us focused and on task. Um, some strategic issues was designing a system that is responsive to local needs while also maintaining equity as a central priority. And that speaks a lot because we are, all the districts, I know we have 120 counties and every county is very different. And we want to honor those and we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs. And so that's where the account, that's one of those things that we grappled with was how do we make sure that those things happen? Identifying priorities to support the development of skills that are all students need to become successful. And you notice we put that word in there, all, all students. We really want all students to be successful. Okay. I really feel like that really connects back to both the Vibrant Learning Committee and the work that they're doing, but also BNF, because as we're thinking about using a portrait of a learner to drive some of this work forward, that we've really got to be thinking about those that development of skills. Like, how are we teaching our students through those vibrant learning experiences to demonstrate those skills? And then how does that move forward with our, our assessment and accountability? Okay. Um, we also looked at defining essential features that we want to lift up in a, a system of systems design. Um, and that's work that we're still in the process of looking at systems and looking at systems bank. And then some process issues that we're still grappling with. It's developing that shared understanding of other initiatives that are going on in the state and the policy structures that we're working within. And we've talked quite a bit about there's always a lot going on in schools. There's always a lot going on in schools. And it sometimes it seems like it's just one thing after another that we're we've got to keep doing this but we also got to start doing this and we got to think about doing this and and how can we can we manage this work and keep this focused on what it needs to focus on and then also just improving that committee meeting attendance and engagement like i said there's a lot going on with everybody and and making sure that we've got all voices coming in because we don't want to just keep talking to the same people and they're the only people driving that work forward we want to make sure that we're including everybody and everybody's perspective Okay, so questions for us. Nobody's going to ask a question because they're all thinking about going to break. Oh, wow, there's snacks in the bag. <laughs> Andre has a question or comment. Andre has a question. <laughs> <laughs> what, you, what are you talking about? No, um, I just wanted to mention for everybody else uh, that the some of the products that we have in, uh, are living in a folder that's accessible to all of you. So if you're interested in seeing that report where the design mm -hmm. principles are spelled out, that in uh, all the uh, constituent mini reports that sort of made that happen, 
that is accessible to all of you. We also worked across committees recently and created both um, a cool council glossary mm -hmm. where we sort of try to put some language to some of those terms so you will see that the vibrant learning definition is in there but also things like system of systems and the assessment system accountability system what does that mean that's a living document but at least you know it's uh, several pages where you can maybe see whether the terms that you are interested in are there if not let us know we can add that to those and we pointed out uh, published glossaries in the literature and in the field that you might find valuable as well. And that's uh, in your folder. There's this two pager with the list and the little big fat QR code. If you click, uh, if you scan that, then you go to the folder. So, um, and there's maybe some other things that we have uh, also additional resources. So that might be also something for the other committees maybe to say, if you have any additional resources that you want to share with other committees and the Cool Council more broadly, maybe let everybody know where they are um, so then uh, we can all have access to that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'm out. I'll be brief because break. <laughs> um, nope, because this is about all three of the committees because one of the themes it's it's running through all of them. We're talking about um, system of systems and changing things. Part of the issue with putting more things on top of what's there is we haven't drilled down and addressed what's already there. So when we talk about this work and we're talking about uh, altering what assessment looks like, I would like to hear more conversation about the accountability part and who's held accountable. That means we need to address and look at all of the legislation that's in play, all of the policies that are in play that are indeed the inequitable barriers. If we don't eliminate those barriers on the, brown, on the ground level, at the fundamental level, we can pile all this pretty stuff on top. We can do project-based learning. We can talk about vibrant learning experiences, but if you don't address it at that point, are we spinning our wheels? So when we get into committee time and we really hash this out, I would like to see if we can't discuss that a little bit more. Anything else? We will take a few minutes of reflection time um, like we've done for all of them. So think about the moonshot. Think about your role, your committee's role, and then we'll come back together and then we'll have a break. Well, all right. So as everyone makes their way back, um, well, let me introduce myself because I didn't do that this morning. So I'm Karen Dodd. I'm the Chief Performance Officer here at the Kentucky Department of Education and also the KDE lead for the United We Learn Council. So I want to personally thank each and every one of you for being here. This has been such amazing discussion so far this morning, and I really appreciate everyone's engagement here today. We are now moving into our conversation about the moonshot. So we heard a lot about that from uh, Vice Chair Young this morning. Uh, and even in our, our kickoff meeting last year, what we were really challenged with coming up with a moonshot for changing education in Kentucky. So we never really put pen to paper and said, this is what our moonshot is. And I think it may have caused a little bit of confusion as we have gone through this past year, trying to get some work done and figuring out what all of our deliverables are. So job one for this, this convening is really to make sure that we know what our moonshot is. So we're gonna work through that here this morning before lunch. Uh, lunch is here, by the way, so once we wrap up this, we will be having lunch, but this is really, really important work. So we are, I'm going to turn it over to Donnie, and he's going to explain the process, and uh, then we will, we will get down to business. Donnie? Awesome. Thank you, Karen. Uh, as a former science teacher, I'm potentially overly fond of extended metaphors, uh, and so I'm going to pick up on the theme of the moonshot. Uh, one of the kind of interesting questions in there is like, why choose the moon? Is it, is it some arbitrary thing that's out there? Uh, but in fact, the moon has water, which you need to survive and also make space fuel. Uh, it has minerals, it has raw materials, it has reduced gravity. 
It has places that can be safe from radiation. In other words, it's actually a beautiful jump off point for the rest of the solar system and thereby the stars. So it's not an arbitrary choice. It is a purposeful choice because it opens up something, other opportunities that will be meaningful for the future. Uh, and so what our question is, is what is our moonshot? What is the thing that will open up greater opportunity, greater possibility, greater change for education, as Karen was just noting? We've heard again and again uh, from the L3s, from your work, from multiple sources, uh, including numbers, numerous surveys of across Kentucky, that things like assessment and accountability change are an important gateway to shifting the nature of education in the Commonwealth. But really, we need to get down to clearer terms about what we are really aspiring to. So that's the aim of, of today's session right now before lunch. Uh, Chair Robinson articulated that path. So it's how we'll get to that goal. But we need to name that goal uh, in greater detail and integrate across the work of the three committees. So we're essentially NASA in this analogy. Yes, get excited. That's very cool. Uh, and we have to decide uh, exactly, you know, where we're going to try to land. Because the you may not know this because I know this because I'm a super space nerd. Uh, my entire family were Star Trek characters this Halloween. So just in case you, my cred was in question. Um, but there was actually a lot of discussion and argument among the engineers at NASA about where on the moon to land. Would they land you know, in this region versus this one? Ultimately, they settled on the Sea of Tranquility for Apollo 11. But that was through a lot of deliberation and discussion. And that's, uh, I just want to put that out there because that's what we are going to do right now is engage in a discussion at your table about what is the right moonshot for us. Okay. So the way we're going to start is just going into multiple data sources. So in the green folder that you have on your table, uh, there are multiple uh, sort of resources and data gathering products, first of which are the key themes that were related to assessment and accountability in particular, but also student learning and families and engagement uh, from the original United We Learn report. And so there's also data sources from engagements that we did with the Superintendent's Advisory Council, Students' Advisory Council, uh, and a number of other organizations. The whole United We Learn report is actually linked in there uh, as a QR code. So you can also access that if you want to refresh your memory about where that came from. You also had discussions just now in that past hour about what you heard from those report outs that might inform the moonshot. So what we're going to ask you to do now is actually we're going to we're going to be standing up, but we're going to put all of those data sources, maybe move all your things, your your stuff kind of into the middle of the table, create some blank space, lay out all of the things that are in the green folder. So go ahead and do that. Kind of make some space because we're going to be kind of carouseling around the tables. All right. So I'm going to leave these instructions up here, but now you should have all of your you should have your different data sources out. You're going to literally stand up and walk around your tables. I'll wait till people are ready. Yep. All right. So just look over here. I'll, tell, I'll give you the instructions of what to do now. So you're going to be moving around your tables and you're going to have a pen with you and you're going to read each resource and you're going to underline anything that really resonates with you that you think would be a powerful piece of this moonshot, this definition of where we're trying to go. Uh, after everybody's had a chance to kind of mark up and underline things that they, they really feel connected to, you're going to, as a table, start to look at, well, where is their commonality? There's a piece of chart paper on your table, on your tables, and you're going to start writing your moonshot. Discuss what you think is uh, should complete this sentence. As a council, we will dot, dot, dot. 
but you're going to use the sort of uh, trends from the underlying activity to help you get started. Uh, after we do this, just to give you a preview, we're going to start sharing between tables and we're going to start to kind of try to combine and kind of see where there's commonality and merge them together. All right. Oh, thank you. The superintendent data is inside of these packets that you received when you checked in. So if you want to draw from that as well, that's some things that they that they are also sharing. OK. All right, start underlining, start hybridizing, start combining and synthesizing. Go. OK, uh, we're going to have each group share out. Now, this is an important moment. We've written a lot and remembering that everything that we write is not going to be in the final moonshot because the moonshot is meant to be concise, right? And it's meant to be uh, sharp. And just like when people, it, when John F. Kennedy said, we're gonna land on the moon, he didn't go into a paragraph saying it's going to be three people. It's going to include somebody from the Midwest and from the, you know, California. They're gonna land safely, they're gonna come home. You know, it was, there were a lot of details about that moonshot don't need to be in the galvanizing statement that helps us know where we're going. So uh, what I, after we share this out, uh, anybody who wants to join a discussion during lunch to try to synthesize these for a presentation after, please come join us. We'll just be sitting up here, like chomping away at trying to synthesize this. But just recognize that this is, meant to be an inspirational moment. We're all surfacing a bunch of really powerful ideas um, and that we're all going to try to sharpen our language and get it down to something that feels like a rallying cry for all of us. OK. Um, all right. Who wants to start? Uh, oh, I think Karen's got the mic. Do you want to start over here? It's <laughs> not me. <laughs> yeah. Great start. Great start. Thank you, Susan. OK, so uh, we are still drafting, as most of you are, uh, but we can talk about the high points and what we meant to say. It doesn't say it yet, but here's what we meant to say. So this is our shared one right now. As a council, we will create a locally relevant accountability system that incorporates multiple avenues of assessment to demonstrate personalized evidence of learning. We're not sure that all the qualifiers are in the right place. What we want to say is that there is a broad accountability system for the state that incorporates inside that some local decision making that's created by the community and the stakeholders, all stakeholders, not just the community, but that includes students teachers, classified staff, uh, parents, everyone. So the, all stakeholders are deciding for the context of their community what's important, what do we want kids to know, be able to do, and be like when they graduate, and that kids will have um, some choice, lots of choice, and a personalized way to demonstrate that. So that's what we're trying to say. Um, we we kept saying we hope you all said that because we kept moving all of our personalized and local and all of that around to try to say that. So that's what we're trying to say. Yeah. I offered to hold the sign. Okay. And Travis did, did so it. Well. He did so well. Uh, so we have a little preamble statement because Donnie you visited us and said the moonshot is the thing you'll do and we did have a lot of things about vision that we cared about so we said in service of a reimagined Kentucky education system uh, our council is going to uh, re-envision an accountability umbrella that does the following things that recognizes and addresses inequities that values students educators families and communities that honors local state and federal priorities 
inspires deep partnership and shared responsibility within communities, but also across communities that prioritizes having environments that ensure physical, emotional safety for students, educators, and families, and recognizes and incentivizes that each child have vibrant learning experiences. Not as concise. That's <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and thank you. Awesome. Round of applause. And, and I think just remembering that we're going to try to get it to a sharp statement, but many of the things that we're writing are going to be in the like meat of what we are talking about, about how to get there, how to do it. Yeah. Donna, you want to give your... Here. No, you want to talk? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, do you want to talk? Again? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Not done, of course. Um, but as a council, we will create and champion a unified, equitable, transformative educational ecosystem, which will be safe for everyone, intellectually, physically, emotionally, and socially safe. This is students, families, teachers, everyone will be safe, which will end. We will remove existing barriers, which we know there are, right? Policy barriers, funding, practices, biases, because they're there, time and structure, which really does go into policy a lot of times, because there was a teacher in the group, she talked a lot about time. Time is a huge barrier when you have the script of things you need to do, right? So all of this will lead to the vibrant learning experiences and the opportunities we want for all kids. Okay, we also went with the anchor statement and action phrases. So we're our done. and and we're we're done. No notes. As a council, <laughs> we will drive improvement by transforming our assessment and accountability system to promote individualized success that reflects the needs of all families and communities. By and these we envision these in in this order. Number one, engaging, listening, sharing, and collaborating and sharing a rich picture recipro reciprocally ooh, within communities. Number two, creating the conditions necessary for all students to be agents of their own learning, to demonstrate readiness for future success. And we had a note that we would hyperlink the word all to a definition of those populations that we intend to include so that no one feels left out. Those that have 504s and IEPs, those that are transient, those in DJJ. We want to make sure all knows we mean all. And then number three, focusing on the integration of durable skills, soft skills and parentheses, in student learning and academic outcomes. Round of applause, huh? thank you. So uh, as we break for lunch, so I always knew that someday my esoteric knowledge about NASA and history of space flight was going to come in handy. I have another extended metaphor for the thing after lunch. Man, we got it. This is going to be great. This is like the best day of my life. Uh, it, you know, when when President Kennedy made the announcement about the moonshot, it was met with like like people in his own cabinet were like. What are you talking about like it was a, it was actually a really stunning moment for them as well and it took time to build the trust across his own team for them all to sort of see how that was going to be possible what was embedded in that and so i just want to offer up that story because we're going to do some work right now we're going to try to bring together these pieces and try to create something sharp like that moonshot description a target where are we going to go where are we trying to what what thing are we going to accomplish? But that's going to involve some trust. We're going to have to say to each other, yes, I don't see the exact phrase that I had in there, but I believe, I believe, right, that we're all seeing the same thing here. Uh, so we invite anybody who wants to uh, be a part of that to just come up here because we're going to take these posters and we're going to try to pull them together into something sharp. Uh, something galvanizing, something that will be our rallying cry and moonshot. Okay. 
uh, appreciate all of the incredible work. Uh, we've built a lot of shared knowledge and some some deeper commitment right now. Thank you to the morning presentations from the standing committees. We're making progress. It's amazing. Uh, and so have lunch, relax. We're going to be back here at 1230. 1230, yeah. Uh, lunch is on the fifth floor. Uh, Melina and Stacy are up there to let you in. So enjoy lunch. And as Donnie said, anybody who wants to help on with the moonshot will be down here. Uh, enjoy lunch and we'll see you back in 45 minutes. Thanks, everyone. Uh, all right. Hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, so there was a, about eight, nine, ten folks who spent a lovely standing lunch together working over the incredible products that you came up with prior to lunch. That was the fastest 45 minutes I've ever experienced. Uh, what I'll say, the, I'll just speak to a little bit of process. And then you can see it up behind me, uh, behind us. So what we looked when we looked at the four products, we realized that many of them uh, included both a why and how. And that's very important context, but a very sharp moonshot is really just about like the what we are trying to achieve. And so that. But we tried to live in there, try to build in the deep me like meaning and energy that came from the conversations that we heard and captured. The uh, there's a whole thing that actually is amazing. We were like so multimodal. Sarah typed all of your things into um, into ChatGPT and asked it asked it to summarize. Uh, and it came up with something really interesting. So we will we will share that uh, in a moment, or or later when she emails it to me. But it so there's a whole page that can sort of meaningfully come after this that describes what does meaningful mean, what does it mean to matter to these different groups. But they what we were trying to capture was this sort of uh, parsimony and brevity that would leave us with something like quite clear and and galvanizing is something we could say to our neighbors and our friends and our community members. Like, what are you guys doing at the Cool Council? Well, we are shaping a meaningful accountability system that matters to students, families, educators, and communities. So that's it. And I would invite like the members of the folks who were working on this to, to share. Yeah. Ed? <laughs> Um, when Kennedy said, we are going to land on the moon and bring a man back, people were inspired by that. And I don't feel real inspired by this statement. Um, and, and I also want to tie it to a recent book that came out. Ours was the American dream written by Leonhardt who's a Pulitzer Prize winning writer for New York, New York Times, I think. And, he, and it sounds like it's going to be a real downer book, but it's not because he went through history and he recognized all of these ups and downs that we go through. And that when we were at downs, there was always somebody, not always, but there's someone you can look at and say, they were an activist and really changed the way we looked at things. So I'm going to make a real off the chart uh, suggestion. And that is the Cool Council will re revive the American dream of public education for all. And then we could get into the accountability and assessment and all that sort of thing. I heard some oohs and ahs. Or, yeah, so, yeah, the, and I had several, thank you. I, I always, I mean, I think the sense is good. It's the foundation of our democracy. Uh, I think the, 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 I, we may have the same sort of feeling, I wonder, Penny, because I heard, I heard your 
thought here. It's like the, the idea of reviving the American dream is a, t- is a challenging one because the American dream has, has a lot of energy. So I'm going to keep thinking about that, Edna, and but I would contrast it with President Kennedy did not say we are going to uh, tap into the ingenuity of the American people. His his what we got from the moonshot was really clear direction. So I want to be inspired and meaningful and matters does inspire me to a certain extent. But through my lens of having been a professional educator laboring under under a system that was neither meaningful no, nor mattersome, um, I think think we lost just a touch of inspiration when we went with the verb shape. I was gone by the time we got to shape. Um, shape feels a little doughy to me. Um, we The original word was create. We tossed around reimagine, uh, design, and redesign, for example, but one thought on that one. If we can find a way to have uh, an aspirational uh, statement to add to that that doesn't burden it, um, but I thought what we were after here was less about the inspirational vision and more about the clarity around the moonshot, so that people knows what people know that what we're about is creating a meaningful accountability system that matters to people. Yeah, I, um, So this is this is really thought provoking and I really appreciate Edna you bringing that, that up. Like one of the things that occurs to me is what if what if this? I mean actually when you think about accountability it's supposed to engender trust and faith. And what if our outcome is that we restore trust and faith in public education? Right, because that's what the, that's the nature of true accountability, right? So, okay, let us let's take that provocation and and go and and see if we can work something up. So, so something that I saw a lot in the um, individual posters was that is distinctly lacking here is safety and equity. That's it's not there at all, but. Um, you you can't really have or well you can have the accountability system but what will that really how will that really help students if they don't feel safe enough in their environment to be able to actively use that and enjoy that and how can you have that without every school having the same means to really have that with the equity how how i, I just feel like it's missing from the moonshot itself which, yeah, it was, uh, and we we talked about both of those things, and we were going for the something brief enough that we could say, and that when we started to think of and live for us in how do we define both meaning and mattering to everybody. Uh, and I don't think anybody would say that both those things don't mean are, aren't meaningful and don't matter. Um, but we hear you. I will, like I said, I think right now, what my suggestion would be is that we could just continue. We hold this, and it's not perfect. Uh, and it was created through a collaborative, co-creative process, uh, and that co-creation door sort of remains open. What we want to do right now is start to ask ourselves and, and invite additional thoughts and feedback on that. Um, so thank you. This has been super thought provoking. What we want to do right now is also acknowledge that we there's it feels like there's something close here though, right? Are we are we feeling like close-ish? Uh, 
that we have this idea that we want to create this system that will result in greater safety or, or be it with it embedded in a safe learning environment that serves equity, that is meaningful and matters to important stakeholders, that that's the accountability system that we want. So we'll hold that. Hopefully those elements feel still true. So the, the goal right now is that we have this moonshot draft, imperfect as it is, uh, and we are, we're now sort of in this position of saying, all right, well, we've been also working together for a year. And so we want to try to figure out, well, what, how can we celebrate the things about our work that have gone great? And how do we uh, engage with the things and start to address the things that haven't gone well? Here's the core issue that I would name that we're solving for. Attendance and engagement has been variable in both the council as a whole and within standing committees. So that's something that's really important because look at because of the presence of the people that are here, we got important provocations about what will make the moonshot better. We, every product improves with deeper, richer engagement of a broader and more diverse set of stakeholders. But if they're not there, we can't, we, we get stymied in the progress that we try to make. So that's something that we thought a lot about is like, how do we actually get that better? Uh, and so what we tried to do in the leadership team, the cool leadership team that tries to plan and support the standing committees and organize this is we did what's called a journey map. So if you look around the room, you see these huge pieces of butcher paper. And over here, uh, you'll follow You'll follow me. Yes, the, the camera, I guess, is also. <clears throat> so this, this journey map uh, is a timeline for each month between November 2022 and November 2023. It has some key events that happened both at the council level but also some things that happened at the leadership team level. So things that we did uh, at different times over the course of this process. What you'll see here is little stickies that indicate a smiley face, a neutral face, and a sad face. Those are, that's meant to represent sort of the, how did I experience that? As a member of those teams, how did my experience of planning for the kickoff meeting, how did I emotionally experience that? And through the lens of like, did I feel engaged? Did I feel empowered? Did I feel excited? And so what we all did as a leadership team were start to fill out little notes like this. So I wrote for planning the kickoff meeting, I said, I experienced a sense of possibility in getting ready. It felt really collaborative and co-creative. So my energy level on that and kind of level of engagement was high. And so I'm putting my little data point here on the, on the journey map. And we did this for a whole bunch of these just as models. And so, you know, for, uh, you know, we put it for different ones and you can see like the level of sort of excitement, engagement went up and down for different people at different times. For different events. All of the standing committees have also charted out key moments in your standing committee. The different things that happened at different times. And you also have the cool council activities, key activities up here too, just so that you can see uh, and map it onto that too, because you also experience that as members of the council. What we want to do right now is gather some data from you and your experience. What were some of your reactions and in, or experiences with some of these key moments? Were they moments where you felt engaged and empowered? Were they moments where you felt disengaged and why? Because our goal for this time after, after we do this is that we'll take a look at all these and we're gonna try to synthesize them all. And there's going to be some clustering, we would guess. There were things that happened that, and ways in which things happened 
that might have been disengaging or particularly empowering. And we want to try to learn from both of those. And so th that will help us, your, your committee folks and the leadership team, start to think about processes and supports that might drive and uh, sustain high levels of excitement and engagement. Does the why of this make sense? Does the how make sense? Probably not quite yet. So what we're going to do is uh, you're going to come over with to your standing committee's poster. And you're going to share some post-it notes. We have lots of them around. And you're going to start looking at the activities and start jotting down how you experienced that and why. Was there something in particular about how it was planned, how it was executed, how it, you know, what, framing for it, whatever. You know, they, your experience is your experience. We want to know it. So jot that down on the post-it note and then place it up where it fits on an emotional scale. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, sorry to, to restate what Gretchen said is it could be a logistical barrier. It could be like, these times don't work for me. This mode of engagement doesn't work for me. This level of frequency doesn't work for me, right? They, these are these are things that could be a part of the barriers. Okay. This is not for us to like dwell and wallow in our <laughs> uh, in our things. Actually, if you look at everything that we've accomplished, it actually like feels really great. Um, but it is to help us solve problems. So I told you there was one more element of the extended analogy here, and I was like really excited about it. So Apollo 13, which many of you have seen the movie. It happened because there was an oxygen tank that didn't spin and rotate correctly as they were going into their launch sequence. And that caused a catastrophic failure that almost destroyed the, the whole mission. When they came back, the engineers didn't just say, well, I guess that's just a feature of the, of the, uh, of the Apollo uh, craft, the Saturn V rocket. They said, you know what? We need to understand the root cause of the issue. We're going to solve that. We're going to solve the motor issue and then they had a series of successful launches after that. That's what we're doing right now. Where's the where's the servo motor broken? Okay. Uh, so thank you for riding along on my like three hour extended analogy. Uh, so uh, this one. DNF is over here. Yep. Blue. AI is green, and VLE is yellow. So you can go to your committees, board, and begin to work. All right, uh, we're just going to ask each committee to uh, just give us a quick update on what they discussed, uh, anything that that emerged that you want to share with the, the whole council, and if there are some if you feel like you want to share like a, a working group that you know you want to uh, foster tomorrow or uh, put forward tomorrow, then you can go ahead and name that. Just as a reminder, sorry, as a preview for tomorrow, when we come back, we're going to do some initial kind of work together, but then we are going to split up into working groups that are cross committee. So they might be about a thing, uh, about an like a a tool that ever they want feedback on from across committees. It might be about a, a process issue that emerged from the journey mapping that we want to try to bring together a group to solve. So it's an opportunity to break down those silos, work between committees. If you have an inkling of something you know that you might want to work on, then go ahead and name that. Did I Yes. 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 You'll still have standing committee time, but there's also at the same time some working groups that will be cross standing committee so that each standing committee will send a emissary to go and engage with that that group. Yeah, that's that's sort of what we're doing now is sort of voicing those out just so that we can start to think about those options. But we're also going to do that first thing tomorrow morning. So if you haven't thought of them by this moment, that's okay. Yeah, by each group. So does anybody want to start? 
Byron learning experiences for perhaps? Ben. <laughs> Uh, we had a vibrant meeting, of course, that's what we do. Um, Susan, you ready? Uh, we have three working groups in vibrant learning. Uh, one working group was about definition. Uh, one working group is about making simple shifts uh, for folks to shift into vibrant learning, um, know how to begin. Uh, and then the MAP group uh, made some progress on the uh, criteria and the submission process for, um, for the MAP itself. Uh, we all made some progress, but I think I want to turn it over to Susan to talk about because there was a specific question about the definition this morning. So um, just hear a little bit of an update about what happened with the definition of vibrant learning. So we didn't have enough time to get back to our full group of vibrant learning. Um, so we're not ready to share the draft yet because we want to get that input from them and have a shared understanding of that before we share it with full council. But what we our process though was uh, we took the draft that you saw and you, uh, many of you gave feedback on, and we read the feedback that you gave in the survey that Karen sent out a couple of weeks ago. We considered um, and found some trends in that and considered some of those revisions. Um, then we also took some feedback we got from the L3 community of practice. Well, we put it before them because they are uh, engaging in vibrant learning experiences right now. So we're, we were specifically asked the question in that um, place, uh, would this describe, uh, you know, the things that you're seeing in your classrooms in your school? So we took those two pieces uh, and some um, input from the Vibrant Learning Group, and we made some initial revisions uh, that we will take to our Vibrant Learning Committee full group tomorrow uh, to get their feedback on and hopefully be able to bring that forward. And just again to reiterate, the importance of that is if we are going to identify and have people self-identify what that means, the definition is just the beginning uh, to then later, later develop the criteria that are specific for vetting those so that you can't just say, I've got one, I've got one. We've got to make sure that we're vetting the process. The definition is that that step that will then help us develop criteria. Thank you. Um, and Susan, you want to hand that over to? Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. A AI, let's do it. Basically, I wrote, wrote some notes in terms of what we did. Uh, we discussed the systems of systems and what it might look like. And one of the things that was uh, that has stuck with me and will stick with me as we go through the process of looking at systems and systems is Jennifer explained to us to make sure that we were all uh, on on task in terms of understanding what a systems of systems looks like. And so we have a grad we have graduation requirements, right? OK, the state has graduation requirements, but within the state graduation requirements, there are local requirements. So that's the system of systems. You have the state requirements, but within each one of the but within the state requirements, each district or each district has its own requirements for graduation. So when I'm talking about systems of systems, that's what we're talking about. And so in our discussion, uh, we talked about gave um we talked about what it might look like in terms of a menu of options. Uh, we looked at things like performance tasks, uh, backpack skills, and what was the, what was the, who wants to shake? Micro credentialing, I'm trying to remember all, we had six of them. And then we didn't vote, we just kind of what, talked about what our preferences were and, and narrowed it down to three examples of what we think might look like when we have the essential designs. And so that's what we'll be working on, in the, especially when we start to look at what our goals are for the next six months. Our next six months goals will be focused on what our system of systems looks like and what are the essential skills that we will uh, look at in terms of accountability and assessment. That's it. Great. And then uh, bold new futures. Slowly in. Okay. 
All right. So um, we had a, a very bold meeting that was for Edna, um, where we actually approved um, two important pieces of committee business and pay close attention because the first one is coming to all of you next for action. Um, the first is uh, our members back during our April convening uh, spent a lot of time reviewing an opportunity analysis, looking at the state's policy system, where there were barriers, what opportunities might exist to um, begin to shift the policy system to better align to the vibrant learning experiences that we all know and love and saw um, in our initial exhibitions at our November convening. Um, at our April convening, we prioritize some of those recommendations. Uh, members selected where they wanted to see our committee really focus uh, our energy. Um, and so we are in the process of working through those one by one uh, to really dig in, get detailed um, uh, recommendations to bring forward for consideration. So all of you voted on the first one um, right before this particular meeting, which was on ways to generate more funding and supports for districts who want to explore this important work and begin piloting in their own communities. The second one we looked at today um, dealt with uh, trying to create an aligned vision for what um, uh, learning expectations we want to see for our students. So what we noticed in our policy research um, is we have a Kentucky portrait of a learner, which articulates sort of these six attributes that we believe signify readiness, right? Um, we also have a portrait of a graduate uh, that the K Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education put forth with 10 attributes for readiness and success within the post-secondary system. And what do you know if there aren't three different components in the statute that describe other attributes that school districts are also supposed to be meeting <laughs> um, that suggest student readiness. And so there's a lot of different um, places where we talk about what we want to see students being ready to be able to do and demonstrate. And there is alignment, but not complete alignment. Um, and so what our committee was very interested in seeing um, is an effort emerge to look at all of those competing resources and to begin to have a conversation about how those might be aligned into a here P to 20 continuum. So we stop thinking in silos. We don't have our um, early or uh, um, uh, early childhood community operating over here, or K-12 in here, and our post-secondary in here. So really building out a P-20 continuum and beginning to see what changes might need to happen to align all of those different statutes, et cetera, to ensure that that is communicated. So that information will be coming your way soon. Um, our recommendation was that that process be housed within the Commonwealth Education Continuum. Um, for those not familiar, this is an effort um, that actually exists. It's a partnership between the Kentucky Department of Education, the Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education, and the Lieutenant Governor. And so it brings um, all of the different sectors of the system together already, and they meet. And so that might be the right place, potentially, and you guys can all decide when you review, um, to begin a work group to explore what alignment could look like. Um, the second thing that we tackled um, is picking back up around uh, the proposed uh, changes to graduation requirements that the Kentucky Board of Education is looking at. Um, we were tasked uh, as a committee to go out and do that deep community engagement work to um, engage our networks uh, around a data collection activity to try to better understand what the community thinks about this proposed change. And so we collected that information, analyzed all of those responses, and we drafted a memo um, that we plan to, to send to the board on November 15th. Um, we did uh, make some uh, beautiful red line changes to that amendment. There was great wordsmithing going on in our committee, um, but we got to a place where it was formally adopted. So we are prepared to send that uh, to board members um, this month and we'll be sure to send it around to everyone for review okay anything bnf members would add okay yeah
heard talked about the intended audience and it was drafted for the board members to receive. And no secrets. No secrets. It's just it was really for them, and we don't. And you should. We actually, as part of our conversation, which really leads into the conversation about work groups, realized we need a similar document that is public facing that talks about the value of the portrait and the feedback um, that we've received about the best way to go on this journey. Um, and so that's a product that we'll really want to advocate for its creation. However, this document is really for the board mm -hmm. to receive during. It's just clarification. Yes. I'm not sure whether you're talking about whether you mean to share it with this group at all or share with them for some decision. So we talked today, and I think our group voted that it would be internally facing only for the board, was the vote that we took today. We recount this to So, okay, so, so, so what our members, we had a putting on our community engagement hat. That's our, our job on our committee. Um, there was a lot of really rich conversation about how do we, how do we make sure that as a council, when we are engaging with communities, that we are um, talking about this work in a way that is really approachable, that makes sense, that doesn't feed into concerns or conspiracies about things. And we, drafted the memo based on feedback from community members. And I think what Meredith is saying is if we start to share that, it could get sent to everyone and everyone, and everyone. And then all of a sudden, we have not had an organized sort of structure around how we're creating that content, what it means, what it says. So what our committee is very interested in doing for anything external is we actually want to work on the community engagement around like what are the key messages that stakeholders are raising that they're mm -hmm. concerned about how do we put together resources to communicate and better address those so a memo to the board if that gets out and that's the communication no. around what's no. happening the that memo. could be problematic and i think that maybe in sharing it lillian i think there was one um miscommunication there. So that was changes to our memo. We didn't make proposed changes to the graduation no. requirement amendments. Our committee did not do anything with the regulation. It was the drafting of a memo, which was a synthesis of the feedback that, that our members received on this proposed change. And it just provides feedback and recommendations to the board as far as you know, keep in mind if you move forward with this change, how to think about community engagement in the implementation phase, um, how to bring uh, along stakeholders throughout the process. So no, no changes to the regulation at all. That was not what was the task for us. Edna, did you want to add? That the summary that I gave this morning is basically what the feedback is from the stakeholders. And that's it's elaborated on a little bit in this memo but that's the main thing and then there's recommend those recommendations around good communication implementation and so forth yeah yeah it, <clears throat> one task that uh some of us well what we did while y'all were in standing committees was uh digitize all of the journey maps so all of those now exist in an online space that can be accessed by everybody. And there were some interesting trends. We haven't, we've read through everything, but it's, we're still digging into it because there are some working groups that actually this, what we're just discussing now might actually address some of that, right? Like when do we do certain things? Who gets, who has to see certain things? What's the process that actually builds trust and makes sure that everything feels like it's being transparently done? Not that there wasn't, it's just, I think people have questions. And so there's, but that's also been true for many of the things that have happened over the course of the past year. And a lot of that emerged in uh, the, the journey maps that we looked through. So there are going to be a few working groups proposed tomorrow that might address some of that. Like, how do we actually proceed from a like functional process standpoint that will help us make sure that we are doing things with the collective energy and uh, openness that we hope to, to have? So that's great. Um, 
OK. And Karen, do you want to say anything else? I was just going to ask if there's anybody who wants to reflect on the experience for today. We've done this the last couple of convenings where we just turn the mic back over to a couple members and tell us what you heard about today. What'd you learn? Anyone? Dang, y'all didn't leave any options. Okay. Well, how y'all doing today? It's good to see everybody. I was, you know, I haven't been able to make really any, if not all, of the uh, meetings of our account, like for our committee, because of you know pre-existing circumstances and things like that. But when I came here, I learned. I feel very up to speed with what we went over. You know, I I came into this like, what's a system of systems? That makes no sense. And then I got explained to me and just how that gets broken down. And honestly, I, I'm going to leave here because I can't come tomorrow. I have an exam, but um, <laughs> busy, busy, busy. And uh, honestly, I'm leaving here encouraged, optimistic and seeing I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes. And hopefully I'll be able to make a lot more meetings now. And uh, I'm very excited. So that's all I got to say. Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Trevor. Any other brave soul? Guess who wants to talk? Um, as someone who's been a part of this since Dr. Glass's listening sessions and the coalition, I will be brief when I say the first time we convened as the coalition, Dr. Glass gave us a charge. And he told us that we cannot do this work if you come to the table only using the lens of the group you're representing. I'm a parent. I can speak for teachers. I can speak for administrators. I can speak for the babies. I can speak for my parents. So that told me empathy rules the day and flexibility comes close second. I say that to say sometimes we can't take our hat off because the little title or that little category on our tent tells us we're here as a teacher, we're here as a superintendent. But that resonated with me and it sticks with me in this work. Your lens needs to expand or we will continue with siloed work and we will deal, be meeting for naught. Just something to consider when we come back tomorrow. Thank you, Penny. Anyone else? All right, we're going to go ahead and call it a day. Oh, no, nope. we do have another. Sorry. No, no, no. Be good. Um, so this morning, the talk about truancy um, stuck with me some. And then hearing the term like ecosystem instead of system of education, um, has been kind of echoing in my mind. As I think about, um, I teach high school, a truant student who joins by like Facebook chat or something on her friend's phone um, class when she's at home babysitting because their her mom's babysitter canceled, her mom had to go to work, she had to stay home and take care of the baby. Um, Another student who has a dad in the hospital and a mom who has terminal cancer. Um, he's at home taking care of his mom when his sister has to go to work. Um, he's truant. These aren't like excused absences. Um, another kid has to drive his grandmother to lots of doctor appointments. Um, and so that just stuck with me, like trying to get thinking of the system, the ecosystem that these kids need um, and the support that these families need um, to get them to school. The kids who are being bullied and would rather stay at home 
than come faced like another day of this crap at school. Um, that that we they need a more supportive ecosystem, like not just a school system. Um, Hello everyone, if I haven't already spoken to you. I'm new, but I've learned a lot of information today. But one of the things that I thought was very, very important is that we must remember who our audience is. And that when we're communicating this, that we've got to make sure, you know, we know that people are at all different levels. And so when we're at this high level, We've got to make sure that we're communicating when we do our ads, when we do our media, that we are trying to meet everyone so that we can get this buy-in that we want. So we're cheerleaders and we're cheering this on and we want them to get our infect it become infectious. And we don't want to leave anyone out based on where they are in their understanding. So we got to make it plain. That's what I learned. Beautiful. <clears throat> Uh, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, lots to consider. We're going to do a bunch of work to try to synthesize. We actually have two different drafts of the moonshot to share with you, but we'll do that tomorrow. Um, and at least two. I see now like people are perking up. You're like, ooh, there's two. Maybe there could be three. Uh, and and then we'll also be surfacing the working groups tomorrow for uh, in addition to the standing committee time. So. Just remember, I don't know if you saw this in the um, in the agenda, but tomorrow sort of culminates in large part with uh, some respondents from the community, from the broader Kentucky community, who are going to come and listen to the sort of the work to date, and uh, and sort of connect it to their work and give thoughts, feedback, and ideas. Um, we'll also have a celebration of everything we've accomplished uh, over the past year. So just stay tuned. That that's all coming tomorrow. We'll start at 830. You can leave your binders and your name tags on the desk. This door will be locked tonight. Uh, we'll have plenty of food again tomorrow. So come hungry <laughs> and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone.